Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from several exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by the A-Team. Alexis? Uh, hi, from Belgium. From Belgium. Alessio? <laughs> Hello. Audrey? Hey everyone. And I'm your host, Ven. Today, we're going to be slinging spells at Eon's End, getting stuck in the middle with the Between Two series, and pedalling furiously uphill with Flamme Rouge. But before we get into all of that, we'll start with the standee catch-up. What have you been up to, Alessio? <laughs> I, I mix it up sometimes. Oh, well, uh, that's novelty. So, um, I've been uh, up to quite a lot. There's, uh, uh, first thing I have to say, I finished the Metroid Dread for Nintendo Switch. And it was very welcome. I love the game. I, I I love Metroid series. It was about time that a good uh, 2D Metroid uh, was published. So I'm uh, very, very, very happy with that game. A bit short, a bit leaning on the short side, but very, very good. <laughs> and after that, uh, there has been uh, Essen a few days ago, something ago, depending on when this episode will air. But there was an essence sometime in the past. Yeah, and I'm actually waiting for the delivery of Siege of Rundar that uh, actually our Patreon Dario, so thank you Dario, hi. <laughs> our Patreon uh, uh, who went to Essen, who went to Essen actually bought me. So I am impatient to try a co-op uh, Knizia title. Uh, it possibly will be good. After that, Res Arcana, Lux and Tenebre, which is the old expansion, there's a new one uh, which already arrived, but uh, which is the old expansion, there's a new one uh, which already arrived, but uh, the old expansion was on BGA, so I'm binging plays there. And that's it, that's my week. So, <laughs> uh, anyone ex anything exciting uh, happening, Audrey? On my Anyone ex anything exciting uh, happening, Audrey? Um, on my side, well, I had my birthday not long ago, but that's not very interesting in itself. I think we uh, recorded the episode while happy while saying <laughs> happy birthday, so <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yeah, it hit if uh, Ian then lately. I mean, to to prepare uh, this week's episode. Uh, on the, my birthday, I did craft a legendary armor on Guild Wars 2, which not many people will care about, but it is a big achievement in the game, because now I don't need any more, any heavy armor on any character, which is pretty good for my... <laughs> and uh, with my boyfriend, we've also had a few uh, pen and paper RPG sessions lately. We had the Starfinder sessions, which where we're going to... where we're playing the campaign against the... Um, the insectoid uh, invasion and uh, it's going pretty well and well and uh, my boyfriend is DMing the Descent into Avernus D&D official uh, campaign for the fifth edition and we played that one as well and I multiclassed my bard into a paladin so she is now uh, bard six paladin one and I'm still hesitating if she's going to take two paladin one and I'm still hesitating if she's going to take two of three paladin levels to have the smite and maybe enough feature because she isn't casting many spells so she will use her spells to smite the enemies when bashing them <laughs> the very important question is in English is in English, would her class now be a bardin or a pard? It's a pard, definitely a pard. <laughs> a pard, yeah. probably. Yeah, a pard. Yeah, a partner. That's it has an old Wild West vibe to it. So that's it for. Uh, well, recently I was able to play a game that we talked about uh, just a few episodes ago, a uh, culture adventure. Unfortunately because uh <laughs> because of a logistical error we ended up with the german version uh, thankfully Ooh. i i was i was uh, surrounded by german people they didn't try to to play uh, to play around uh, the game doesn't have that much text so it wasn't too bad uh, but i had a, a wonderful time uh, with the game my, my first game i failed my first three um tests to get the challenge and i ended up uh, mild 
and I ended up uh, miles behind everybody else. Uh, and uh, by the time that the, the game ended, I had, I think I had half as much points as the highest uh, highest one on the board. Your character was the one, like when you're reading through the book and it goes, oh, it's an Alexis chapter. I could just skip this. And you're reading through the book and it goes, oh, it's an Alexis chapter. I could just skip this. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, but uh, the second game went uh, a lot better, um, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed the uh, Cold Your Adventure. Thank you for the recommendation, Ken. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? It's uh, just a bit different than the route. We, yeah, we, it is. We are uh, we are our best customers. <laughs> All right. So what about you, Fen? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was hoping no one would ask again. Um, then, uh, then just re, re, re record that and no one asks. No one. Uh, I've uh, just been going back and playing a few games uh, that I've had for a while. So we've been playing some Race for the Galaxy. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. One personal but, favorite here. But uh, the it, we're still playing the original um Quadri aliens artifacts a bit. Uh, it, the game's frankly timeless, but that's partly because we're also looking at new frontiers. Because I'd like to play a Puerto Rico style game again without feeling, oh god, the colonialism is such a, a huge like part of this yeah. game. Um, and New Frontiers, huge like part of this yeah. game. Um, and New Frontiers uses a lot of those mechanics apparently. So. Uh, New Frontiers is is here waiting for for the games, but we start playing Race of the Galaxy ahead of that. However, the main thing we've been playing is um, with all of the Horizon Zero. The main thing we've been playing is um, with all of the Horizon Zero Dawn expansions here. We've mm -hmm. been playing through that, and I talked yeah. about that quite near the beginning of this podcast. Um, and I said I'd touch back to it when we got to play the expansions. It's early days. It's very clear that mechanically the game is found on cooperative play exclusively. Like it's it, it, it the difficulty's right when you're playing semi cooperative, but it feels a bit awful. Um when you're like you're screwed and you're having difficulty and somebody else looks and goes, Well, I'm just gonna let you faint and then mop up this machine. Um tough luck like co-op bits and pieces they ramp up nicely if you fight one of the big really nasty machines at the end because those are very tough and do require a lot of cooperation um but it is definitely you can feel that the the machines are not as tough as they should be for a group all working together of like i'll chuck a stone and shoot them with a bow and then with a stone and shoot them with a bow and then when they're alert to me you can step in and stab them from the grass um so it's a little bit of a shame it's a great game and I really enjoy it. I love how the, the characters play because each one's a deck of cards that you shuffle up five to play from and as they take damage you discard cards either from hand or your deck and you can the, the characters play because each one's a deck of cards that you shuffle up five to play from and as they take damage you discard cards either from hand or your deck and you can craft to replenish that and all of that, those deck mechanics feels amazing and the leveling up is just brilliant. It's just they needed a set of separate AI leveling up is just brilliant. It's just they needed a set of separate AI cards for cooperative play to just rack it, ratchet everything up a bit. That makes tougher. sense, yeah. Um, yeah, it all had multiple like difficulties. So if they're like, oh, if you're new to this game, then you can just play on the standard. And then here we go for experienced players. Amazing, just an incredibly fun game better with the expansions as I thought it would be because there's all the variety you could ever want um, but it's just for people who are experienced in really hard kind of cab style games this one's like quite casual I see well it's, it's not a bad thing sometimes to have a few casual a campaign that's four fights boom 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 job done you know we can fight something different and try different characters um, which is where the other slight wrinkles appearing. It's very clear a few of the characters are considerably better than the others, and I don't know if Steamforged are going to patch that or not, because they've been pretty on the ball with updating this game, and fixing exploit characters are considerably better than the others, and I don't know if Steamforged are going to patch that or not, because they've been pretty on the ball with updating this game, and fixing exploits and stuff, but we'll just have to see. Suffice to say, Fire is just a bit... Like incredibly powerful. 
so yeah that's what we've been doing stuff but we'll just have to see suffice to say fire is just a bit like incredibly powerful so yeah that's what we've been doing um and i think now it's time for us to uh to, to, well for audrey to take us on a journey to to grave grave home Grave Hall, the city uh, where the game Eon's End takes place. I hope my cat doesn't disturb me while I talk because he's around right now, but he doesn't want to say hi. Um, <laughs> anyway, back to Grave Hall so, uh, and Eon's End. So Eon's End is a cooperative element uh, to the game, actually. The designer is Kevin Riley, and the artist are Gong Studios. It's been published by Action Face Games uh, through Kickstarter, if I remember correctly. I, 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 I don't know. It might be. Um, <laughs> yeah. They will know. Uh, if, for me, like, I've only... I just got the app, so... But, yeah, the, this is true, yes. Uh, Aeon's End was published through Kickstarter, and... Um, a, 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 while, a while ago, the delivery initially on the Kickstarter of the base game was planned for November 2016. So it's still a pretty recent game. I mean, it's been there for five... So it's still a pretty recent game. I mean, it's been there for five-ish years now. And uh, when I ask, when I see people in the French community ask for a cooperative deck building game, it's always the top one that comes out. And the second one is Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, but uh, Aeon's End is always battle, but uh, Aeon's End is always, always the first time. So it's really a classic in its category. Now let's dive into the game itself. So the idea is that each player will control a mage which will cast spells to defend the city of Gravehold against a nemesis and the nemesis in the uh, base game and I think eight or nine mages. Each nemesis has its own behavior, its own character, some specific cards, while there are some nemesis generic cards, and each mage has a special ability that you can trigger when you have uh, charges, up to four or five, uh, depending on the mage, and a starting uh, deck. Each turn, there will be an initiative turn order, which is basically cards. In a two-player uh, game, you have two cards for the Nemesis, two cards for player one, two cards for player two, and you shuffle them at each different turn. So no one play at the exact same position at every turn. If you are starting to be more players, three players, the Nemesis takes two turns, each player gets one turn, and there is a wild card for the fourth player turn, which doesn't happen since there isn't a fourth player, but players can pick who will play. And for four players, it's obvious who will play. And for four players, it's obvious one card for each player and two cards for each nemesis. That, uh, in most games that I've had, was a big, a big issue in the game because people were trying to play in order and not paying attention to the card. So that's a mechanic that can uh, damage the fluidity, um, damage the fluidity uh, of the game. Yeah, it's, it's weird that, because if you think about Midara and games like that, they have the initiative track with the same design of randomized order each time, and it clicks. But the moment it's cards, people are like, whoop, fixed order. Yeah. And so now, how does a player do effects? The cards that allow you to buy cards are gems, and they give you a, uh, a currency, which is eater, that you will use to buy the other cards, which is where the elements of deck building enter into play. And you can also buy charges with it. Generally, uh, paying cards are from 2 to 8 eater. A charge are two types of uh, these cards, spells and relics. Relics have some effects, and generally spells are damage, uh, cards that deal damage to the nemesis and or its minions. So you will, the player will spend the eater gained by playing the, the gems card, playing the, the gems cards, and prepare spells. Now, how do you prepare spells? Each mage has four or sometimes three breaches uh, available. Some are open, some are closed. You will have to pay either to open the ones that are closed and the ones that are open allow you to play spells on them and the ones that are open allow you to play spells on them. When you work on opening uh, a bridge, because it can tame some right turns, every time you spend some eater on it, you can also play a spell on it. And you will act.
activate the spell and make the effect at the beginning of your next turn if you want and skip you can keep a spell on the bridge and not play it if the bridge was already open and so there is that element of management of do I cast this, this spell that I had prepared this turn or do I maybe keep it for next turn because that may be more interesting as I have a combo coming up it a bit apart from deck building games is that at the end of your turn you draw uh, cards to replenish your end which that part is not um, different but if your pile is exhausted you take your discard and make it back into a pile without shuffling so I'm not that kind of exactly what you play in which order you can be able to know which five cards you will have uh, for your next turn and then be able to plan ahead and that's very interesting because it adds a layer of complexity in the game. Yeah, this is one of the things I think is like really good about Eon's End. Because first, I think is like really good about Eon's End. Because first of all, you're not sitting reshuffling after every like exhaustion through the deck, which adds up a lot of time to a lot of deck builders. And the other thing is, you've got, as you said, you can, if you're good at remembering, you can remember the order your cards coming in, and you can also manipulate the order by choosing where to put things coming in, and you can also manipulate the order by choosing where to put things in the deck, and so you, they'll come together later. I think it's brilliant. Mm. And the Nemesis turn, it's very simple. First, the Nemesis can have some passives, powers or minions that uh, activate. Powers always uh, are, are always active of time, and you can prevent them by discarding cards, etc., depending on the power. And the minions do a specific effect each turn they activate, and you can damage the minion. That's the Nemesis uh, beginning of turn, and then you draw a card from the Nemesis pile, and you do its effect. That's very simple for the Nemesis turn because it always tells you to make the Nemesis board. And for now I tried only two Nemesis of the base game, uh, which are the base one, which is Rageborn, I think, in English, and uh, the Carapace Queen. I think she's called in English. Basically, she's pr produced a lot of bugs to, to destroy. It, it really felt like Starship Troopers uh, as we were fighting a swarm of bugs. And they really all have different mechanics there. You, you can really tell that each Nemesis has uh, its own uh, behavior. And that's really interesting. Its own uh, behavior. And that's really interesting. Uh, on honestly, that's something that we've talked a lot in the in the cab game. But it's the same in the on end. You really have something different uh, every time you pick a different nemesis. And uh, you pick a different nemesis. And uh, so I've had a few plays lately, and. In the game, you have the tools and the, the cards, uh, actually, to prepare a random uh, market of cards. So you end up with nine cards, three, re three gems, two relics, and four spells. And you can draw. It's something that I can re recommend the first time playing against an Nemesis, to discover it, to discover the spells, to discover mages. But I thought that the game end has this element that we find as well in the cab uh, games, which is die and retry. You fail against a nemesis, you say, oh, okay, so I need this, I need this, and the mages that you will want to use and make it work. And the second game that my boyfriend and I did against the, the Carapace Queen, uh, we had uh, lots of cards uh, selected to generate charges, and I had picked up a mage, which is a control mage, and you can spend up your four charges to, your four charges to say, nope, I'm not activating this nemesis card, it doesn't happen. And we had such a generation of charges that I could do it every two turns. Basically, one turn, uh, once every two turns, the Nemesis wasn't acting. Which was a complete difference from the previous game where we were destroyed. Which was a complete difference from the previous game where we were destroyed under the swarm of bugs. And, and <laughs> So yeah, it's it's really a game that can be frustrating the first time that you encounter a nemesis, but then you learn from it, you learn how the nemesis works, you learn how the spells work, how the combo of combo of spells work, and then you do something out of it. So yeah, I, I really think that I'm not going to say that at the last time we specialize in cab uh, games, but it's something that we are uh, generally interesting it, and even though uh, Eon's end 
isn't a card game. It shares some of uh, its... It's kind of boss battling. <laughs> yeah, there's no table, but yes, it's kind of boss battling. Yeah. Kind of. I'd, I'd say it's completely and totally boss battling. Yeah. I, I've had the chance of playing it while I was uh, at your place, Audrey, and it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It was also... Ex <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that when you randomize the, the items that you get from the market, uh, the game can really get hard. And it can really be a, you know, a, a lot harder than it ought to be sometimes. Uh yeah, but I am not good at designing combo. So sometimes. Yeah, but I am not good at designing combo. So now every time I will play with my boyfriend, I will say, okay, you prepare the market, and I will use it. <laughs> and he loves uh, everything that goes with theory crafting, so that's completely his domain. But I will say something is that Eon Saint is my favorite cooperative two-player games. But Eon Saint is my favorite cooperative two-player games. Oh. That's yeah. uh, high praise. Yeah, honestly, uh, I think that yeah, it's the best as it's tight. Uh, everything is written on the card, so you don't have hours of explanation to prepare everything on the card. So you don't have hours of explanation to prepare everything. And then, yeah, the, the play is very interesting. Yeah, I one of the things I found really interesting about this is... Um, it's labeled as a deck builder, but really you've got to be super careful about how you build your deck. You've got to be super careful about how you build your deck and what you're putting in. So it's, it's re I don't want to call it a deck crafter where rather than just every turn, add more cards, add more cards. It's, it's great to have a lean deck, have a focus. And sometimes you put spells into breaches and you leave them for the right opportunity to use. Uh, it's off as soon as you can. And, that's a big part of doing well, I found, is just having that restraint and that forethought of just being, okay, what do I need to be doing? What's yeah, going to help I, me do that? Which Against I the Bug Queen, we selected a spell which uh, deals three damages when you cast it. Generally, the Nemesis has 70 uh, HP to make it, uh, HP to make it uh, on the scale. And if you keep it on a breach and you don't cast it, it deals one damage to a target. And we used that spell a lot to destroy the little bugs as they all have uh, one uh, HP each. And every turn we had this as a cleaning mechanics and we had our other spells that as a cleaning mechanics and we had our other spells that we used to damage uh, the nemesis. So yeah, when you know about it, yeah, that restraint is very, uh, is paramount to the game. And also something that sets it a bit apart from most uh, deck building games is that you don't really play a big part in deck building games. Yeah, you have to be very careful about what yeah, you Yeah, the, the, there's that spell uh, which uh, does one damage and lets you call one card, right? Yeah, so, some relics uh, in the game are there to let you destroy uh, cards. Yeah. So you can destroy the starting spells, you can destroy the starting... Uh, you only have two relics per, per game, and generally you will have one which lets you kill gems from your deck, maybe kill spells, but not both. And so you, com compared to many uh, deck building games, you will know that most of your uh, starting spells will stay with you for the duration of all the game. I, I played just two games. Uh, in the first one, I was uh, destroyed by the tutorial Rageborn. So with the tutorial setup, I played on the Steam game, which was uh, kind of... It, it, uh, the game i in itself was very fun. Uh, I think it was earning experience because uh, a lot of stuff was automated, so I had to pay attention a bit more. But yeah, in the I, I colored uh, a lot of the initial one damage spells, so I planned poorly for the next turns because I ended up with uh, entire turns made of gems. So yeah, I, I like that there's the possibility of uh, charging up uh, the innate power of uh, each mage because that was uh, what saved the turns. In the end, uh, I lost to a minion which uh, kept damaging gray, uh, grave hold. <laughs> so in the end, it was kind of a disaster. But second mm -hmm. time around, I won. So, yeah, yeah. fun. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, 68 points for the Rageborn, right? 
What? Uh, the Rageborn has 68 points, right? It wasn't... Uh, uh, it's <laughs> yeah, the, the tutorial version of the Rageborn is not an easy uh, version. It has just some cards in a specific order. And honestly, I don't think it's a good order. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the, 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 the great thing about the... The, the game is the great thing about the the, the game is actually that uh, all subsystems are kind of uh, all useful at the same time the yeah. the thing you do to channel breaches and opening them uh, it pays off and uh, you can uh, uh, build and opening them uh, it pays off and uh, you can uh, uh, build up a gem economy which is working because there are minions who, uh, and powers who require you to pay gems to, uh, to pay either to discard and uh, you can always do something with gems so that's very unbalancing your deck building you are still able to play and to play significant combos in the game that's very very cool uh, thing uh, that I, I actually agree with you, uh, there should be more ways to curl your deck because uh, uh, which never has what you need. <laughs> I, yes, I, I but that, that's also where the charges mechanics uh, enter in play because if you don't have to buy a card every turn, you can just charge up and then at some point use your power and say something happens. Yeah, yeah, th that was a noob mistake by me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this game's not here. This deck, yes. Priorities. Like, uh, church your deck as much as you can. And for people who don't know, um, Dominion's first ever removing card was church. So if you played Dominion, it was always called churching. Get your deck thin, lean, <laughs> mean, and let it get fighting. But don't stick stuff in it if you don't need it. And that's, that's get fighting. But don't stick stuff in it if you don't need it. And that's, that's what I like about Eon's End. Um... I have the Legacy version, which I haven't had a chance to play yet. Uh, we're probably going to touch back on that next year. <laughs> I've been looking at the Legacy version since it was announced. I've been looking at the Legacy version since it was announced uh, for the French version. I think in the late spring, and then it was pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, and then uh, delivery during October happened. And when I checked last time, it was sold out. Yeah, that's why I scooped it up now, because I was like, this isn't going to be here. Yeah, that's why I scooped it up now, because I was like, this isn't going to be here uh, in springtime when they come over and visit. I, I, you know, I need to get it and squirrel it away now so I can actually play it. It's, I, I opened it up and took a look. It's fantastic. It's got like everything nicely sealed. It's got plenty of space, even if the cards are sleeved. It's got um, the sealed. It's got plenty of space, even if the cards are sleeved. It's got um, like chapters, these little packets that hold everything in them for the story and everything. Uh, so I'm hoping it's as good as Acquisitions Inc. for Clank was, because the Clank Legacy game is amazing. And I speak of someone who has not, someone who has not really watched Acquisitions Inc. or listened to it at all. It does You just don't need to. It's just like everything fits, and it's so well written. Yeah. And, and based from what I, I heard, both from Ian Zand and Clank, uh, after playing the Legacy game, you just have your own personalized copy to play, however you want. Yeah. Yeah. However you want. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's something very interesting in in Legacy games when they allow you to then uh, play uh, the n normal mode, let's say, but with something that uh, has the marks of what you did. Yeah, charter stones like that. Um, uh, we stones like that. Um, uh, we played that, and actually has a double-sided board. So we've got a refresh pack to eventually play with the in-laws because we played through charter stone. We're like, this is a pretty. It's easy to get to grips with as a worker placement game, so it'd be suitable to, for them. So we're gonna we're gonna play that on the backside, and then we'll have two different versions of the board. Yeah, that does sound nice. I, I love a legacy game that lets you carry on playing it afterwards, and yeah. there it is. Yeah. And there is a last point uh, that I want to touch up on Eon's end uh, before we go to another game. It's the art style. It's very simple. There are no, and uh, it's not a very. I think it's very clear. You can identify all the the parts, all the the gear, the attributes of a mage very easily, and it's 
you have a good uh, spread between male and female mages, and everyone is fully clothed. <laughs> you see that these uh, female mages are fighters. They are not here to play. They are here to cast their spells, and that's it. And that's always something uh, that you enjoy, that I personally enjoy, and especially when it's been something indie. I mean, Aeon Zen basically is a bit more. It's it's still indie, but it's grown bigger, let's say. Um, but yeah, that's something that I appreciate when a game that came basically out of nowhere uh, and not from an established uh, company has this kind of setup and setting and art style. Yeah, yeah. The um... I'd say the design interface. Say the design interface is very functional. It's yeah. it's clear. It's not going to wow you like crazy. Uh, I think the art itself as well is it's it feels soft. If you know what I mean, there's like it's a it's not a sharp hard style. Everything's quite ethereal in a way. Yeah. Way. Yeah. Which is yeah. Um, lots of pastel colors. Yes. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a damn fine game, and yeah, I think I think it's one of those ones that if you want to play a deck builder that's a bit different, um, and as you said, a cooperative deck, cooperative deck builder, which are not not very common, this is just right up there with the, mm. the choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a cooperative game with cards, I would probably still prefer Regicide. But I have to say that as a deck builder and cop, I, I was that as a deck builder and cop. I, I was looking out at my shelves wh when we while we talked, and I actually have nothing better than a, than I on send. So it's. Uh, it's not just uh, well. There's nothing better, so go with it. It's actually a good game. It's a good game. It, it's it's probably the, the well. There's nothing better, so go with it. It's actually a good game. It's a good game. It, it's it's probably the best uh, in its in its own category. Yeah. I haven't tried the Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, which, as I said uh, initially, is often uh, suggested as well. In plan to do that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm sticking with the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if you're going to play Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle, uh, I'm going to go and play Book of Madness instead. <laughs> yeah, I prefer that game, even yeah. though it's not a deck builder, but uh, still. All right, uh, so it's all towards something well, uh, more mundane, more historical, with uh, but not not boring with some architecture, uh, and that is between two cities which is it's fairly oldish as well um i'm trying to remember exactly when it was released oh 2015 it first came out that's right so but not very bit, old yeah. yeah but i know not super old compared to say race of the galaxy um but around the same age as eons end you know uh and it's a one to seven player but really like three to seven player one to seven player but really like three to seven player semi-cooperative tile laying game now you will sit down and on your left and your right before you reach the other players there's going to be a little grid and a token representing a city and this is the literal like in a city and this is the literal like title means you are sat between two cities and you have to build those cities with the person on your left and the person on your right uh, cooperatively while they're doing the same with you and somebody else who's either on their left or their right further away so everybody's working with one other person to build a sit down and start playing to, to click but uh, that's the concept you've got two cities you're working with other people it's, uh, you will just, on your turn, you'll draw tiles um, at the start of a round, and you'll have seven tiles, and you need to pick two of them. One of them's going to go in combinations for those cities. Early on, that could be whatever, but later on, it'll um, you'll be looking for really specific stuff to score. This is like Seven Wonders, if you, or any kind of drafting game if you played Magic and Drafted, because once you pick those, you're going to take the tiles, and you're going to pass the remaining ones to the person on your left, and then everyone will reveal the tiles to the person on your left, and then everyone will reveal the tiles they picked, and talk with their partners about where to put which tile in which city. 
tiles score points in a varied way. Gardens want to be a big, giant, connected group. Uh, shops want to be in straight columns or rows. Houses, shops want to be in straight columns or rows. Houses, they don't care where they are as long as they're not next to a factory. Factories want to be as many as possible in a city. The biggest, most factoriest factory city scores more points per factory than the ones without. Uh, taverns want to be in sets of different, different kinds. Offices just want to be on the board and next to taverns and as many as possible. And everything's competing. You're always having to make a bit of a compromise about what you're going to do to get your points. The real rub is, at the end of the game, the winner is the person whose worst city has the highest points. So in 100 points in your city on the right, if you've got 10 in the one on your left, because you've scored 10 points and you suck. And so does the person you were building that city with. So, you know, last place for you. Uh, and it's it's fascinating. So I played this with Audrey and Alexis to show them. Um, it, and it, it's in particular because I wanted to show this version is, isn't it just so dull looking? It doesn't look great. It, it could look swarse, but it's definitely very drab. And if, if anybody is picturing... Uh, a game where you build a city, they're probably picturing what's on the card. It's extremely simple city, they're probably picturing what's on the card. It's extremely simple, it's just uh, your picture idea of what a house looked like, your picture idea of what a factory looked like, and you slap that uh, dap on the on cards and there you go, you have the game. Yeah, it's just a little it isometric drawery uh, picture. Um, you know, it's just a little it isometric drawery uh, picture. Um, you know, uh, the art, no, no disrespect to the artist. It's they're nicely drawn, but when you put them all together, it's just every single office looks the same. Every single house looks the same. It's it's it is helpful for people who are playing and want their tiles to be similar. But I think we know like handle cut tiles looking a bit different and having the same function. Um, in my opinion, it's not really a problem in itself. It, it looks simple and everything, but you don't get lost uh, in the details, uh, like we might speak uh, just a little bit later. Um, I very quickly what the things are, and I also thought that uh, for colorblind people, as uh, the symbols are very clear, very well identified, uh, it can be an easy game to play. Yeah, it, there is that. Yeah, uh, there's definitely benefit to the style, uh, especially given your gamers, because they will. You can sit down, and explain the rules in like two minutes, um, and then all they need to get their head around is how the different tiles score, and off you go. And it's 25, 30 minutes a game, pretty fast. You can play three games in an evening and have room to play other stuff, which is great. I just think because it's such a, a, a gateway game style. It would bring more people in because you know there's nothing like the world's collection of euro games and the, i mean if you put them all into a vat and mix them up the color would come out would be beige you know? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that's just the only thing i think and when you get to the expansion which is capitals they've actually done that on the new t it's, i think the same artist but there's life to them there's like people running around or walking and all sorts on these civic centers um and you can also get a a park like a, not a park like a landscape tile which is a three uh, three by three tile that sits in the middle and you build on a five by five grid instead and you get more tiles and it all kind of builds on a five by five grid instead and you get more tiles and it all kind of it just looks nicer um so there was definitely a route for them to uh, redo this and make it look prettier and maybe they will uh, that would be nice, at least. Uh, especially when you look at all the little city tokens, you get wood, at least. Uh, especially when you look at all the little city tokens, you get wooden city tokens, and there's one to represent each city. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, so th there's so many. There's actually, they're, they're collectible, because um, Stonemaier did a whole load of, like, con-exclusive ones that you just can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the, the arch, um, there's the pyramids, there's uh, the capital building and all sorts from e uh, everywhere across the world. So that was really cool. They're, they're gorgeous little wooden token pieces and they feel uh, a bit gaudy compared to everything else. Um, I also, I do not, it's ugly and it's hard to operate because it goes from left to right, one to ten, and then the row above goes eleven to twenty, left to right. So it doesn't snake. 
Um, the benefit of that is you can easily count in tens just moving upwards on the track, but there is that moment of confusion and it's a bit fiddly to walk through it all as well. It's um, easy to get lost yeah. with a nice revamp, um, uh, but it may never get one. And that's because of its sequel. Da, da, da. Yeah. So, Stone My Games, uh, like, they produced Between Two Cities. And then there was a game that came out called The Castles of Madden, but somewhere someone went, what if we take Between Two Cities and we slam it into Castles of Mad King Ludwig? Yeah. That... If you've never heard of Ludwig, he had a load of castles built. The Disney castle is based on one of the designs uh, of one of his castles, famously. You know, it's that kind of multiple parapet, crazy, that's a fairy tale castle. And, um, you know, they're Ludwigs. So it's... um. It just slamming these together, and it, it's like they took between two cities and just went, okay, off, off with all the breaks. So, same game principle: you sit down and you're building two castles left and right. But you, but to start with, you have a throne room, and you're building two castles left and right. But you, but to start with, you have a throne room. This has set, set symbols on it: mirrors, shields, uh, paintings, swords, and they it might not be shields. I can't remember the one of them. But they and they also has specific scorings for hey you you if you put certain rooms next to the throne they also has specific scorings for hey you you if you put certain rooms next to the throne room you're going to score more points to focus you at the start. But all the other rules are like building a castle. So you have some rooms go beneath the throne room and they may only go beneath the throne room. Others have to be built on top of existing tiles and you end up with this created kind of sprawling masses that you never really know where they're going to go. And every tile is beautifully illustrated. It, to add on to them all having unique and new separate rules, um, there's neat things that when you get like three of a kind, you get a bonus tile. So you're encouraged to not just go on th three food types. Uh, so that then gives me a bonus. Um, is there is there even uh, two tiles that are the same? For I, I've I think I've mostly seen different different tiles in different rooms. I think there is some tiles that are mechanically similar, but they all yeah. have separate names. Yeah, uh, separate. And e I, I think that's a big, uh, big selling point. Too. Yeah, there, there's a lot of like humor to it. You find like a crepery, a chocolate room, um, a kitten room. room. Yeah, yes. kittenry. Yes. Yeah. yeah the... And the puppy room. Oh, the puppy room. Yeah, it's. Oh, like I, I, I just, it's so, it's, oh, like I, I, I just, it's so much more though because you're, you're looking at all of these. You're not just looking now at where you're putting the tile, and what's adjacent to it, but you've also got to think about what does my castle want? Do I have any special bonuses for particular room types? Um, do I, uh, do I have particular room types? Um, do I uh, do I have like a garden? If you build a garden, you're not allowed to put anything above it. Like this, you have these tiles with blue borders, and they have to have open sky above them. You could build to the left and the right, but that's it. So it, you kind of, if you put a fountain on the roof, you've capped that section of. I, I just, I, 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 if the game's got so much more going on than between two cities, and it looks so much more engaging. But I will say. It's it's a bit overwhelming. It, it, like at first, if you haven't played Between Two Cities and you try and jump into Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, you you may unless you're a very matching player, you may well have some difficulties. And as well compared to uh, Between Two Cities, I had the feeling that due to the art, I mean at some point you're like, oh the kittens, oh the puppy, and oh the <laughs> the, the the hands or stuff like that, and I, I almost felt like I wasn't that. It felt like I wasn't that paying the game the attention it deserved at some point. So, yeah, it's more elegant, more engaging, but it might be not to always to the benefit of the gameplay. Yeah, yeah. Um, the artwork's rather clever in that whenever there's a suit, um, that suit is depicted with it, in that whenever there's a suit, um, that suit is depicted within the artwork, and every artwork's colour-themed. But yeah, you do get drawn in of looking at something and going, oh, look at everything that's going on in this tile. Yeah. I, When we played uh, Between Two Cities, I was very much focused on the two cities that I was, the two cities that I was building, and like, not really paying attention to what you were doing on, on your city. Um, 
But as soon as we played uh, between two castle, I, I ended up often looking at the at the other players' board because I, I wanted to see what they what they were putting down. I wanted to see all of the it uh, not giving me any points. And I think that's interesting as a way to um, build to, to to make the players interested in the other board because in in games like this often. I end up being very focused on what I'm doing. Like in um, uh, it's not exactly the same kind of game, but another player's board when I play Puerto Rico, I do not give a shit about what they're uh, making with their uh, maze, what like hell? they're building any wheat. <laughs> yeah, but but it's also important because as you are then passing the tiles, you may still want to look at what they have, so that if you are hesitating between two tiles look at what they have so that if you are hesitating between two tiles you don't give them the one they will want there is also that mechanic that invites you to look at what they what they're doing a bit more than in two cities where things are uh more simple and so it it feels less important oh yeah, yeah. It, it is tactical well and so it it feels less important Oh yeah, yeah. It, it is tactical in in puerto rico but i it's already involving enough to Think about my next two moves to think about the other the other mm, players' yeah. move, uh, board. But in in between two castle, I was constantly looking at fence castle, even though I had no involvement. I'm interested in how how it was building and how it looked. And it was um, beautiful. I'm yeah, really sad beautiful. I couldn't put the knights next to the chocolate room. <laughs> you were right; they shouldn't have gone there. But in my heart, I wanted them to be able to go upstairs from their like dingy dungeon straight to yeah. the chocolate fountain well in the end i think that i told you that i might have won so he, probably probably but um, yeah yeah it was um 68 70 72 with the three castles yeah we built, which is uh, fantastic like really good. i yeah that's always a um that's always a good show that the game is well balanced when every player ends up with the similar similar scores you um, yeah and that, that's all. This is a versus game. This is definitely a game where there's only going to be one winner at the end. But during the entirety of the game, this was a cooperation game because I was walking alongside Audrey's to try to make a good looking castle that would give me a lot of points. And I was looking, I, I was walking with you to try to get a lot of, lot of points. And I was looking, I, I was walking with you to try to get a lot of points on the castle that we shared. And at no point was I really thinking oh if i do this this is going to hinder uh to, to to hinder them i was just thinking oh let's let's make a castle together this is fun um, i was just thinking oh let's let's make a castle together this is fun uh i i liked it a lot i think this is a, a good a good castle building in you know i probably have uh, uh consideration from the other point of view i never played uh, between Two cities and I played a lot of castles of Mad King Ludwig because there was an Android app which was given for free in the Amazon store at some point so I I thought why not I got it and I played a lot uh, out of uh, Castle of, of Mad King Ludwig and I have there's uh, uh, from what you say there's a lot of the original game in uh, between two castles uh, between uh, the, the original castles was very funny and whimsical but in the end it uh, ended up uh, falling flat just because uh, playing it multiple times panning needed uh, new stuff it needed a lot probably the uh, the sharing mechanics in uh, added from between two cities are what uh, uh, is making this game something more something very fun because i i, I can if uh, I was playing playing points with one of the with uh, my neighbor players, I, I can feel myself more engaged in the game. So that's probably the the best of both worlds. That's part of it, and also in the base game alone, there is nearly two hundred tiles. <laughs> so you are so unlikely to see the same ones, same configuration each time you play. There's going to be new and different stuff, and that's not even including the expansion secrets and soirees, which is I really like the name. <laughs> uh, soiree is such a fun word. Uh, but um, I just wanted to briefly touch on how amazing. The, uh, the I just wanted to briefly touch on how amazing the uh, the design of this game is the physical design. So 
in the core game you have a red uh, tray shaped like a like a castle tower like a parapet and it has all the wells for putting all of the um the tiles in that you're going to play with it wells for putting all of the um the tiles in that you're going to play with it also has the space where you put the throne rooms in the middle and it has little inserted sections where you keep each of the castles uh and the game has a unique like castle tokens for each castle they're all real castles it tells you all about them in the book to, to have a look at each one um and then there's a yellow half castle that holds the specialty tiles that you unlock by achieving three of a certain type and the cards and that half castle, um, it joins with the expansion castle from Secrets and Soirees to give you two castles and every box. And I haven't had to go find a custom insert or anything because game trays have done it again. I hate plastic and I hate game trays for making me love plastic inserts, but they nailed it with this. Everything outside of uh, a few, the cards and the rule books and the scoring pads sits in these three trays and they, you even use the label and you're good to go. It's a, it's a real class production up there with like tapestry. But um, I've come to expect this from Stonemaier. Like they they seem to take a lot of care with their yeah with their productions. Um, yeah, it also costs way less than tapestry. Twenty five euros right now. So if you could get it at twenty five euros, that's an incredible deal for this game. Because honestly, uh, I haven't seen anything that scales so well. It's great. I haven't played it with um, the two-player rules or the uh, solo rules, but I've played it with three players. I've played it with all the way up to eight players. This and it's it's amazing. Like it's incredible how well it scales. Although with the big groups, you might find yourself like not paying any attention to what the person sat far away at the other side of the table is doing, and suddenly be like, "How many points did you score? Like <laughs> what? How? What was going on? At why were you guys cooperating?" Like, what? How? What was going on? Why were you guys cooperating and, like, getting that much? This isn't, you know, it just kind of hits you out of nowhere. But given that it's, uh, like, again, just like a 45-minute hour-long game, maybe, um, it, it doesn't matter. It, it's just fun. And building those castles really doesn't matter. It, it's just fun. And building those castles is really, really engaging to me. And uh, as well as everyone plays simultaneously and you just have a set uh, amount of time, the number of players doesn't change uh, the time of the game. Well, of course, if you have someone that always takes like, a bit of the game, but not uh, as much as if every player's play, each player plays at a turn. The, the trick then is if you've got, if you've got an, anal an analysis paralysis player and they take it forever to decide on their two tiles is everybody starts drumming and going, pick the tile, pick the tile. Just to <laughs> know if you've got that player in your group and you'll know if they're going to be frustrating for you with this game or if you're going to be cool with them taking a long time to mi min-max both of their castles as best as they can. Actually, if you don't know who, who the AP player is in your group, it's probably you. <laughs> oh, actually, I know who the analysis paralysis player in my group is. And, and it's you. <laughs> no, it's my boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Julia <laughs> likes to think of uh, five minutes in advance. <laughs> yeah, you, you know that. Or only someone that plays. You, you know that. Or only someone that plays with, uh, that played with us can uh, can agree. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I mean, often he says, "Hey, what if we did that?" And yeah, that's smart. Oh yeah, when we play a, a cooperative game with Julia, when we play a, a cooperative game with Julia, it's great. It's, yeah. uh, it's always some good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's well. I mean, I'm fortunate, and I I tend to think fairly quickly. But also, when learning a game, I'm just like, I'm just gonna make mistakes. I don't care. Just, just shove it out there and get to grip. If I really enjoy this game, I'll. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the player that decides quick, and then two hours later goes, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's always fun as well. Uh, yeah. So 
that we're going to go from um, from Ludwig the Second of Bavaria's lands across to, to talk yeah. to us about our last game. Yeah, uh, we are actually ending our vintage exposition of 2016 games because uh, Flam Rouge is a game from 2016, and yes, uh, you are playing a cyclist. I uh, actually you should be like in France. I uh, actually you should be like in France, but it's uh, as you know, as uh, Alexis could confirm, probably in Belgium there's a lot of cyclists uh, too, yes, and in, in, Ita- yeah. in Italy too. Uh, so much that uh, there's the Firenze Milano in, in, Ita- yeah. in Italy too. Uh, so much that uh, there's the Firenze Milano. Uh, track on the base game. Anyway, one. Yeah, but I will have you know that several times the Tour de France goes just in my parents' street. <laughs> ah. Yeah, l- like the like the Giro d'Italia, like the like the Giro d'Italia, which is our own version of a tour of a national tour. Uh, it uh, passes just uh, just down my parents' home, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, okay, so uh, Flamme Rouge, it's uh, uh, and uh, I love racing games because uh, basically it means uh, everything because it's just uh, you have to rush uh, up to a goal and uh, you can use any mechanic. In this case, uh, you have uh, two, uh, each player is given two cyclists in which are one sprinter and one voler, uh, uh, one roller. Okay, uh, this is uh, all French terms I have to translate in English, so I apologize for every every mistake uh, I roller, will do. Sprinter. Ruler, a sprint, uh, yeah, okay. Coureur, rouleur, flamme rouge, if you need someone to um, be here. Flamme rouge <laughs> means red flag or bandiera rossa in Italiano. <laughs> and uh, you have... If you typo it, it means burning rogue. Yeah, okay, yeah, every, every, everyone uh, typos like that, but rouge it's red and rogue is rogue <laughs> anyway uh, actually, uh always the rouge it's yep. i i see the I, I see the typo the other way around anyway, i think it comes from mmos where people messed up yeah <laughs> Any, anyway uh you get basically two miniatures and each of these miniature has a deck every deck you get you get one deck for, uh, contains cards numbered two to nine which is the number of squares the 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 meeple can move <laughs> for the roller you get uh, a similar deck of the same number of cards but the cards are numbered 3 to 7 so the roller is the, has more middling cards while the sprinter has both the fastest and the slowest card in the game you shuffle both decks and you place every uh, every miniature in uh, in uh, the racetrack. Uh, then you basically play. How do you play? You basically play. How do you play? It's uh, very very simple. Uh, at the same time, every player uh, draws four cards from the deck and uh, picks one to play for one of the two meeples they have. Uh, they one of the two meeples they have. Uh, they do that secretly and then at the same time everyone reveals the card they played. That's the number of squares the 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 meeple can move uh, along the the meeple can move uh, along the track. Uh, then you get moving starting from the player in turn and uh, and you move every uh, every meeple when you have moved uh, actually you have uh, the track because the track is only two squares wide and uh, it's a long race track with uh, with uh, every kind of turns slopes and stuff at this point, uh, there is the smart stuff because uh, there are two very smart mechanics uh, which are uh, also very thematical with uh, bicycles and cyclism in general. So uh, the first thing is that you start from the uh, group most behind in the track and you start moving them 
with a uh, okay i need uh, i think it's a slipstream in english <laughs> group of uh, uh, meeples which has n exactly one square free in front of them not two just one they all at the same time they move one square forward at this point uh, you probably have merged two moves again one square forward if they have one square and just one square uh, in front of them available and uh, uh, as a result you will have uh, one or two or possibly three very big groups of uh, after that there comes a le peloton le peloton <laughs> le peloton okay <laughs> that, that's the expansion actually <laughs> oh. yeah <laughs> you have le peloton which is which should mean uh, like uh, a big group yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly uh and so of uh, meeples at this point there comes exhaustion because basically every meeple that has w at least one square ahead of them which is free not occupied by another meeple they get one exhaustion card uh, basically a card from the for their deck which is uh, capped at a speed of two so a very slow card at this point you eliminate from the current game the card that you just played this means that uh, the more the drag uh, the, the, the race drags on the more it means that uh, the more the drag uh, the, the, the race drags on the more you will accumulate uh, exhaustion tokens so uh, a good strategy for a, a big part of the game would be to just stay in the group uh, on the other hand, if you just stay in the group. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the smart player possibly seeing a slope uh, or something advantageous to them decides at some point to try to uh, break away, I think. <laughs> I, I hope that's uh, break, away, that's, uh, break away when they run ahead of everyone else. And they... Yeah, because... Beca because the sprinter did a good job of uh, preserving exhaustion and until that point and they know that they can try to make one last run for the victory you have uh, a very cutthroat competition with a lot of strategy because basically you have your ruler uh, which is trying to shield your sprinter but at, at the same time the sprinter is trying to preserve fatigue but if you don't move the sprinter two times in a row you probably end up uh, and being behind uh, you are still separated from the group so in this case you still get exhaustion there's a, a lot of deck that uh, in this game there's a lot of strategy involved and uh, th th there are uh, it's cool because it's a very simple game you can teach i, I think in five minutes uh, you can basically play play and have fun with everyone uh, for for hours i, I think uh, the first time i played flame rouge it was like uh, three years ago i think i played four games in the same day because uh, i like it that much i i am uh, like the racing as a goal in a game because getting first to some uh, now it has to be said that uh, the racing category is basically everything because uh, for example uh, race arcana is considered a racing game but uh, a racing game w which to which also talks races like for example uh, formula d or uh, flamme rouge or uh, quest for Eldorado, I have to say Flamme Rouge is pretty unique and fun and uh, very very good. And another thing that can be said which is very good for Flamme Rouge is that a uh, big community. So you can go on Reddit or on BGG and just download every kind of variant for the game, every kind of racetrack. You, uh, there's a lot of people, th there's a, a game app which gives you the most popular tracks there is uh, which gives you the most popular tracks there is uh, a lot of support for this game 
he, he te- it is uh, five years old and uh, it still kicks uh, a lot of us because it's very fun. So that's my recommendation. Actually, if I have to to it's very fun. So that's my recommendation. Actually, if I have to 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 say uh, to state my three fav- my top three favorites fa- favorite race games, I I'll probably say Flam Rouge, then El Dorado, then Formula D. And oh, that's, that's it. <laughs> and oh, that's, that's it. <laughs> we are talking mm. about many favorite games today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I say, uh, there are uh, there are four race games that I think are worth owning to have the variety, and they are Quest for El Dorado and Flam Rouge and Formula Day. That gives you dice, and the other one is Pitch Car, yeah. which is dexterity flicking around a track, and that's phenomenal. But um, I love these games, uh, especially Flam Rouge and Formula Day, for the ability to just play like once a week, and people come round and and race and have an ongoing kind of Grand Prix type thing. But Formula Day has one problem that um, Flamme Rouge doesn't, is that Formula Day has player elimination. Yeah, We've had players eliminated on the first corner, and that means they're sitting there for two, three hours, waiting for everyone else to finish racing, which kind of oh, sucks. No. Yeah. Yeah. See that, uh, how that would be a yeah, that's yeah. why. It's... But uh, Flamme Rouge doesn't have that. However, the big negative point against Flamme Rouge is they still haven't told us when we are getting the grand tour expansion <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's uh, that's like uh, the, the expansions are all great there are it's uh, three years in the making now and they just delayed it uh, again so I, I think we won't see it until at least uh, half 2022 but uh, yeah we we don't know for sure so uh the, the expansions are the uh, weather, met- I, I think it's meteo-like in Italian because I think it's in French it's the same. So he, you basically add a deck of cards which add the property condition uh, depending on weather to tiles. So uh, in the core game you have slopes which can, uh, which can uh, cap your speed to 5 or uh, give you a small boost and giving you always a slipstream. Uh, the weather is uh, cool because it's a kind of a moving slope. It has different conditions, but it's cool because it it moves around t- moves around tiles, uh, speed up or slow down characteristics. So it's actually my favorite expansion. Although the most famous is of course the peloton expansion like Audrey was saying, uh, which is a uh, fifth and sixth player plus, uh, uh, which is a uh, fifth and sixth player plus uh, more tiles, uh, some of which are narrower and some of which are wider. So they add a lot of variety to the game. Grand Tour, which would be uh, the campaign expansion to the game, Grand Tour, which would be uh, the campaign expansion with a bit of leveling up of cyclists and stuff, uh, it has still been announced. It is uh, it, uh, a lot of fans are waiting for it, but uh, it's still uh, in the works. I I wanted to to ask one thing. Uh, I I not I haven't played uh, Flam Rouge yet. Um, you can basically build your own road, right? Yeah. Uh, does does anybody does any one of you knows if there's a a big community uh, to to do, like on on BGG for example, if there's some uh, some sort of a uh, I... you know a li- list of fun uh, racing tracks that that can be interesting to I, play. I usually get my stuff from Reddit. There's a subreddit ah. for Flem Rouge, but. But uh, there's a lot of tracks. I I think I downloaded it uh, years ago, so I'm I don't know how it, it is faring now. But it was cool, and it uh, it actually had a mechanism to vote your tracks, so you could have fun favorites there. And also, uh, uh, there was a, it it's it has been a 
actually released for the Tour de France of some years ago uh, a print and play of a lot of uh, the 20, I, I think all, all the tracks from the Tour de France, all 21 oh, that's tracks. Fun. Yeah, it's it uh, all, uh, from, uh, it's uh, I think Le Grand Tour in uh, BGG, you can find it. Wonderful. Otherwise, from the site of the publisher, which is lotopelit.fi, which should be Finnish. Oh, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we should credit uh, the designer, which is uh, Asger Harding Granerud, which is, uh, who is Danish. Uh, he is the designer from Copenhagen and 13 Days Cuban Missile Crisis. So actually, uh, uh, kind of famous in a few niches. Oh, I like Copenhagen a lot, uh, except for the plastic uh, windows, but it's a fun game. And this was Flamme Rouge. So I think we lost Fen, is probably checking uh, Kickstarter. I think we lost Fen, is probably checking uh, Kickstarter right now. No, I'm not here. <laughs> wow! I just the uh, you just you just finished the topic. Yeah, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I I I own this game and I played it quite a lot, and like my brother-in-law. Yeah, I was, like, I was like, I I I own this game and I played it quite a lot, and like my brother-in-law, one of them is a major cyclist, like <laughs> like really hardcore cyclist. It's like I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I guess we're done. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um. I, I, I guess that's it. That's fun. Uh, it's it's very good. I happen to own all of it, and I happen to play uh, regular with the family, like um, multiple matches, you know, um, races with with point scoring to keep a total on a, a table and everything. But that's just really all I have to say on it. <laughs> you know, um, but at the beginning, so we're going to talk about it here about the greatest Kickstarter that has ever been made <laughs> as a conclusion yes <laughs> yes yes at the conclusion here we're going to build to this so audrey would you like us to uh, like to tell us all about this wonderful creation coming from the dragon's tomb the yes. best place yes. best place for rules the, the, the best kickstarter ever it is a deluxe edition of rock paper scissors in a box where you have a luxury scissors an amethyst geode for the stone and a gold foil for paper. And that's it. So y you have to fight with all the players of a stone and a gold foil for paper. And that's it. So y you have to fight with all the players to play. And of course, the first one to play loses. <laughs> and I just love what I love about this Kickstarter is that. I mean, the pitch itself is so so much. A tr what I love about this Kickstarter is that, I mean, the pitch itself is so so much a troll, but it's so. Uh, yes, we are trolls and we do it well, and everybody is playing along with it. If you have twenty minutes to lose and you are feeling sad, just so quickly, just say. If you got more than twenty minutes to spare, you want to go and watch Jeff Kornberg's youtube channel the dragon's tomb um and he is the best person at explaining rules to games you can possibly <laughs> ever imagine his his review of letter jam has never been surpassed by anyone oh, ever. as well as well there is another thing in the kickstarter which i personally find completely brilliant my page is loading right now so i can read everything and be as faithful as possible to what is written it's that in one of the pledge, uh, which I don't remember the, 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 the price exactly, but uh, it's the $35 pledge, you get one copy of Rock, Paper, Scissors Deluxe Edition and one copy of Offensive Adult Party Game. And I love that because <laughs> as the text read, Offensive Adult Party Games plays just like the other Offensive Adult Party Games you may have played, except there is plays just like the other Offensive Adult Party Games you may have played, except there is only one black card and it reads, I like playing Offensive Adult Party Games because... 
And then there are 19 identical white cards that all read. I like creativity and enjoy the illusion of being funny. And I love that. I love that job. I love that. I love that job at uh, Cards Against Humanity. Uh, in, in French, we have Blancmange. In France, we have Blancmange et Coco and another one, which I don't remember the name. And uh, I, I just love taking that jab against these games which are just trying to dig as deep as possible in and yeah, I, I love that. And because uh, offensiveness is just uh, the butt of the joke and that's it. And you yeah. feel like you've made a funny joke. There's there's a quote from David Turksey which is, I feel my work on this deluxe edition will really make a difference to the millions of solo RPS fans who were previously forced to play to us. Yeah, <laughs> The, all the testimonies from other designers and everything. I'm not. I, I hope uh, that they were all contacted uh, to use oh, yeah. their image. I, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. yeah. Sense. A cheap theory games wrote uh, a paragraph of floor for the game. It, it's all hilarious. Yeah, there's lore. Yeah. It, it's all hilarious. Yeah, there's lore. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff is Jeff is well loved in the community for very good reasons. He's he's absolutely fantastic. Uh, did you know that there's going to be a game trays tray for this? Yes. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just all, and and it's not funded yet. So please, it's just all, and and it's not funded yet. So please, please go make it a reality because such a game deserves to exist. It is currently 71% funded with 15, guy, with 15 days to go. So yeah. let's hope, let's cross fingers. I, I, I don't think, I mean, it's, it is a joke product, but behind it, you do support the Dragon's Tomb as well. Yeah. Which is, a, it is a wonderful YouTube channel. So yeah. yeah. Also, also, it's important to point out, like Kara said, uh, that there is a set for one. Yes, we'll need two sets. No, no, it's like jungle speed. You have to fight to yeah. get the thing. So except that, <laughs> yeah. except, except that in jungle speed, the first one to get the totem wins. It's... In that case, the first one to get something loses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Alessio, you need to go and watch Rodney Smith's Watch It Played on this to actually try to... That is part of the game. I, I'm, so, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry, my bad. <laughs> and, and there is a, the solo mode. I mean, it's, uh, all of it is just hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's a masterful in communication. It's 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 a masterclass. Uh, yeah, it is. We it need is. more projects like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need a few more projects like that. Yeah, yeah. We do. Well, well, all we need is one every year from Jeff, and I think we'll have all we ever need, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, with that wave of a checkered flag, this is all we have time for in this episode. Thank you for listening to The Last Standy forward slash The Last Standy or follow us as The Last Standy on Twitter or subscribe on your preferred podcast app or a podcast app you really hate but you keep using it because there's just, you know, you're too lazy to get a different one <laughs> and you really should sort it out because it keeps notifying you about podcasts you don't want to watch and it's frustrating. Not it's goodbye all. from Alexis. Uh, goodbye from Belgium. It's goodbye from Alessia. Bye everybody. And Audrey. Bye bye, and I will say speak from my experience as well. Mm -hmm. And from myself, and remember that the second E in Standee is for Embrasure. Wow. Oh.